Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. My name is Charmaine Ludlow, and on behalf of Dean Byrne and the entire Macaulay community, I would like to welcome you, welcome you to our Macaulay Entrepreneur Series featuring Stacey Chen, class of 2006. Our Dean always say that our stu students have big, bold dreams, and that is truly reflected in the accomplishments of our alumni. They are leaders in their fields, entrepreneurs, authors, and they were giving back to their communities. Tonight, Stacy will share her entrepreneurial toolbox with us, and moderating the conversation will be Ann Wong, who is a senior at Queens College. Right now, I would like to introduce Stacy Chen. Stacy is the founder and owner of Fin Account Consulting, LLC. It's a boutique finance and accounting solutions firm. She leverages her 12 plus years of finance and accounting experiences gained across big corporations and startup industries and geographies to support startups and small businesses on their financial challenges. Fin Account operates along two main lines of service, bookkeeping and financial modeling. So I would like to welcome Stacy with us tonight. Moderating tonight is Ann Wong, class of 2003. Anne is currently double majoring in media and film studies and minoring in business and liberal arts. Queens call Sit Bala. She is currently a digital media analyst intern at Harmony Baby Nutrition, a biotech startup that is introducing the first human breast milk based infant formula to market. She aspires to pursue a career in media and explore various opportunities within the media industry. And I would like to welcome both of you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Charmaine. Thank you for having us, Charmaine. And Stacy. thank you for being here with us and welcome everybody uh, to our event. So uh, I'll get right into it. And for everybody else that's uh, watching along, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to drop it in the chat and we will try our best to get to all of them. So uh, Stacy, I'll get right into it. Can you tell us more about uh, FINAC Consulting, your company? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, FINAC is a combination word, um, finance and accounting. So I started FINAC in 2019, and one of the drivers of starting it, Charmaine mentioned 12 years of industry knowledge, um, it was really a fairly evenly spent between accounting and finance, but also personal changes in my life. I became a mom in late 2018, came, uh, took my maternity leave, went back to work, um, and realized that as a person, um, you know, that the, there's certain curves. We've probably learned that there's life cycles of a business, and I think there's also life cycles of a, of a human evolution. Um, being a parent was a huge changing point, turning point in my life. So I decided to leverage my experience and start FINAC Consulting to provide, to provide a high quality of service at a fractional basis to various startups and small businesses while enjoying the work-life balance, you know, that term's been thrown out many times, but being able to control my work-life balance and enjoying the work-life balance that I am able to give myself. Yeah, that's amazing. And I like how you touched upon how part of the reason you became inspired to start your own company is because you became a mom and that changed your perspectives a little bit. Um, beyond that portion, is there anything else that motivated you to create your company or influenced you into becoming an entrepreneur? Absolutely. I think so there, there is that inner need uh, or inner desire, and I've touched up on my personal need and want, but there's also the market demand for a product or service. And I spent considerable time in corporate finance. I spent considerable time at Deloitte and Touche doing general accounting, but also at startups developing their accounting and finance team. So through those various roles, I was able to identify a space that I thought was missing. For example, early stage venture backed companies may not have the need for a full-time VP of finance, a full-time controller, a full-time CFO, nor would they have the resources, you know, cash, to pay for someone of a high caliber. Um, I've been in this industry, I've talked to various uh, startup CEOs, um, I've worked in them myself, so FinAct really fulfills that need of 
providing a high quality of service on a fractional basis. And I started in that really with the perspective of FTNA and CFO services. Then in late 2019, um, realized that you have to go upstream. And the reason why is how can you analyze data that may be unreliable? From a finance and accounting lens, the data comes from accounting, the booking of historical and actual transactions as they are occurring. The cash burn happens at that level. The classification of your spend will inform your cash burn at various uh, parts of the um, general uh, general ledger, which are accounts for those who are more accounting savvy. Okay. Um, in order for FPNA, in order for finance to do its job, they really look to, to the accountants and the bookkeepers to do their job first. So FINAC quickly expanded into bookkeeping and accounting operation service. Yeah. So it's um. Really cool to hear you talk about that transition and how that um, you went from realizing there is a shortage or a need that needed to be met. Um, and that is part of the reason how your company developed. And so you mentioned about working uh, with different startups and me interning at a startup company. I know that definitely resources is always a big question mark there. And so I would assume that in the process of you creating your company and building your company, networking also plays a big part in the way that you have developed uh, your entrepreneur career. So can you talk a little bit about the networking aspect and your and any advice or tips you might have for anyone uh, looking to dabble into that? Um, networking, it is a lifelong skill that you need. And I think every single one of us has the um, has those skill sets, it's just a matter of honing it. Um, when we were kids, we made friends at the playground, right? To some extent, that's human interaction, that's relatability, that's networking. At the school level, you're you're talking about classwork, right? Again, finding common thread, networking, helping each other, becoming friends. Um, for me, when I started my company, so I went to Baruch, um, spent some time at Deloitte, then I went to MIT for my MBA, spent some time in corporate finance in Asia, and then came back and spent some more time. <laughs> I feel so old. Uh, anyway, so a lot of time has been spent in many different capacities across uh, geographies. Um, and at every point, had great conversations, learned from people, and was able to continue to develop myself. When I started my company in 2019, um, so let me take a step back. There's those who are natural salespeople, and then there's those with other types of talent, right? So like if you look at your MBTI assessment, your E's might be better sales and your I's might be better like analytical folks, okay? I am INTJ. I hated sales. It was really awkward to go to networking circles and be like, hi, I'm Stacy. you know? This is what I do because one, um, maybe they're not interested in what you do, you know, or, or maybe um, when, when I started my business, I didn't really have a reputation. It's different now in 2023 versus 2019. I didn't have a reputation. I was always selling, trying to get a client. And um, it wasn't easy, but I kept on doing it because I made a conscientious decision to start Finac Consulting. My husband, very, you know, I'm very fortunate to have a supportive family. He, he said, keep on doing it. I'm like, but honey, I'm not making any money. We're not paying the bills. These are real issues. You could have your aspirations, but you have bills to pay, right? right. You have baby to feed and, and, and things like that and mortgage and, you know, real life stuff. Um, but my husband was super supportive. He gave me, both him and I came to terms on the number of months. I said 12. He said 24. Okay. I had to prove my business viability, right? Mm -hmm. There's opportunity costs too. If I had a full-time salary, I would be making X. Right now I'm making Y. So we had to balance that out. So with the timeline in mind, I just, you know, just continue hustling, just continue talking. Um, and then I got super fortunate, landed my first client, and that became my anchor client who gave me a retainer, which is great because now you have money coming in. But more importantly, that first client gave me confidence 
So now I'm not that awkward Stacy going into a networking circle with nothing to support me, nothing to back me up. I now have real life cases, real life issues, real life stories to share as I'm selling. We're talking about my business, right? And then other companies found it very relatable. And now uh, with this initial client of mine, my first anchor client, I worked closely with the board of directors. It was a VC backed company. The board of directors were uh, partners at VC firm. They liked the quality of my work. They liked the quality of the next work. And that broadened my network, right? So there's like these organic circles. There's that awkward networking at a cocktail party where you go into that little huddle, right? Because you don't know what, what, what they need. You don't know what they're interested in. And then there's more natural networking, more organic networking in the sense that, well, we're kind of working together already. I'm kind of proving myself. You like what I'm doing. In your network, you know, that, that amplifies mine, right? There's word of mouth, and they introduce me to them. So I was able to land a new, in my first, C5 client earlier this week through a old VC connection from like 2021. That's awesome. And I think when you were touching on how, you know, starting from elementary school into college and then those awkward networking events that I'm sure myself and everybody else uh, watching has probably experienced, um, we can all relate to the need to build upon that. Um, and even events like this is also considered a networking event. And so, I think this might be a great time to kind of ask you, how has your time at Macaulay influenced your career as an entrepreneur? Um, I mean, the school gave us so many opportunities. Uh, not only did I, so one, I don't know if it's still the case now, the Macaulay students back then, we were first to sign up for our classes. Okay. Okay. That's a huge perk because we were able, able to pursue our interests. I, they en enabled that, they really supported that. Secondly, I studied abroad when I was at uh, Baruch, Macaulay Baruch. I studied in Fudan University in Shanghai for a semester. After I graduated from business school, I went back to Shanghai and worked there for two years, right? So Macaulay gave me the first taste of being abroad, um, of independence, because I lived in Queens and you know there's no dorms at Baruch. Um, so that was, that was really appreciated. And it gave me the opportunity to pursue my interests because we didn't have that financial pressure um, that some of our other classmates may have. Yeah, it's, um, I think we all relate to feeling very grateful that there is the scholarship aspect and also the funding to allow us to explore other avenues that may have been harder to do if we didn't have that support. And you mentioned how that led you to going back to Shanghai to then work there, which I'm sure took your career in a different trajectory before you came back to New York. And kind of looking back at everything now, if you had to do things all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? I'm not sure. Um, where I am today, 6.14 p.m. Wednesday, Tuesday? Wednesday, Wednesday yeah. Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday. I, I feel like any trials and tribulations that got on me here are well worth it. Mm -hmm. Nothing really stands out to me like I should have taken a different path. And I think a lot of that, it might, you know, it ties back to our backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. Macaulay really gave us a lot of confidence in supporting us and, you know, giving us that impression that we're the best of the best. Yes. Right? <laughs> that's confidence building. Yes. Whether or not it's true. Anyway, just kidding. Um, but that's confidence building. So along the different decisions that I made, I, I feel like it was a good decision. Looking back mm -hmm. where I'm sitting at today, I feel like it was a good decision. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing to recognize. And it's not necessarily bad if there isn't anything you do differently. Um, so that's really wonderful to know. Uh, but I'm sure you've also learned a lot throughout your career and since starting FinAct that uh, you would be able to share, like what are some things now that you know 
that you wished you had known before or um, have you ever encountered, I guess, any kind of challenges or business doubts along the way, which I know you touched upon briefly. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how you kind of overcame those obstacles? Um, it's really hard. I think that the type of person we are, it's, it's not built overnight, right? So going back to certain attributes, we need to be confident, but that confidence has to be based on something. I knew when I started Finax, that I was really good at accounting. I was really good at finance. And I was really good at startup advisory because that's what I've done for four years prior to. What I wasn't good at was fail. And what I didn't have was, I mean, Finac Consulting started like yesterday. So there's no reputation. There's no brand. Okay. I spent no dollars on marketing. I had no dollars to spend on marketing. <laughs> I spent 250 on Squarespace, but that's about it. And um, yeah, it, it was it, so, so, you know, just leveraging the network, my external network, uh, my husband's support, my family's support, um, and feeling safe and knowledgeable in my space. So once I was given the opportunity to prove, I was able to, I mean, I hit the ground running. I just really needed a chance. Just kept on going, kept on making phone calls. And I reached out to my first and second connections on LinkedIn. Um, some of them came back, some of them did it, and it's okay. Like I had a develop a thick skin, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. Asian female, we don't do thick skin. Right. right? So I had to like channel my, my inner tall white guy voice and say, it's okay. You know, it'd be like, just, just expect that you could get something, you know, expect that you're, um, you're a professional in your space and other people will, will follow along. They'll respect you. They'll understand your ideas. Mm -hmm. Be able to communicate it clearly, show them what it's, um, going to give them. You know, how is it going to solve their problem? I think another facet of starting your own business is pricing. How do you structure your your services or your product so that it's reaching the intended market properly? Right. Mm -hmm. So I juggle with that. I actually reached out to a female professional services network. Um, I was part of that network for the first half a year. Um, and one of the consultants in that group was able to help me, you know, give me some framework for pricing professional services. Yeah, so I liked how you touched upon um, being an East Asian female entrepreneur, which I'm sure comes with its own um, perks, but also certain aspects that require us to kind of overcome, like the cultural element, which is a big part. And so I would love to develop this conversation a little bit more and see if there's any advice or just any anything really in general that you would want to talk more about uh, for either other women or people of color that are looking to pursue a career as an entrepreneur, especially in fields like finance, where a lot of the times you have men who are predominantly in the field. It's, that's a really good question. We have inherent biases the way we were brought up. Um, when I told my parents, they're, they're supportive now, but uh, when I told my parents I was starting my own thing, they're like, oh, but you're not getting paid. Yeah. How are you going to support yourself? What's going to happen to you? I'm like, it's okay. We have some savings in the bank for like 12 or 24 months or something like that. And, my, you know, thankfully, uh, my, uh, my husband was working. Um, so, so there's that cultural element. There is a factor of us being raised. Like, my parents didn't emphasize sports. I do with my daughter now because I see how important it is to, at a very early age, do sports and teamwork and like communication mm -hmm. and uh, being confident. I think there's a lot of confidence building and uh, team play. Um, so inherent in that, I think it, it was my voice. Therefore, perhaps that's why I wasn't so strong in sales. And perhaps that's why it took me. I didn't get my first client until six, nine months into starting the app. Maybe that's why it took me so long. Um, I am not the only finance and accounting solution in this country, in the state, in the city. There's lots of competitors out there. 
some of them, you know, and I tracked them on LinkedIn, they were able to close sales a lot faster. So that was a little demoralizing, mm -hmm. right? Um, just had a, it, it's really, it's really hard to pinpoint it, but we need to have the, the fortitude within ourselves to say, hey, it's okay. Like, we're, I'm not going to get a sale right away and that's okay, but I'm mm -hmm. going to keep doing it. I'm giving myself a timeline. Sometimes I might have to stretch that timeline, but it's okay. Um, I think as females, we tend to be more conservative. I said 12 months, right? So my husband said right. 24, for example. Huge difference in, mm -hmm. in um, the expectation. Um, I priced lower. Initially, I priced lower than some of my peers, and I know that. But I wonder if that was because I was an Asian female, right? or if I needed to bring a new business. But perception is also very important. If you price yourself too low, then what's the value of your service, right? So you can't, your price point's very important communicating your brand as well. Um, there, there are certain doubts. Uh, when I get into my first phone call, I do tons of onboarding calls and BDEV calls now, but at first, I was just nervous. Am I saying the wrong thing? Um, if I poke them, are they going to like hang up on me? Yeah. <laughs> should, I, I mean, should I just lowball and have a couple more clients? Mm -hmm. And it really takes, you know, you really got to write some rules for yourself before you start your company. What's your product and service? What do you think your price point is? Who are your audience? And you got to have some non-negotiable or bands of non-negotiable because otherwise you're, you're going to be all over the place. Okay. Yeah. So it's um, the confidence, I think, is such a key aspect here, because when you aren't that confident yet, it almost feels like you want to, like you said, you price lower because you felt like, well, maybe I can't price that high. And then you mentioned about how you eventually develop, developed some non-negotiables. So can you share a little bit about what some of the non-negotiables you have for your company? Sure. So we... So, okay, so one of the things, um, very straightforward for our bookkeeping, we have our core competencies and we know that. So for example, we only run on QuickBooks Online, okay? We could use any PO, any payroll company, we could use any bill pay management platform, but our sole core competency rests in QBO. And I've had a lot of inbound requests for other types of services, yeah, but I mean, other types of accounting uh, software, um, where they want us to be bookkeeper. And, and I said, no, because I would dilute my team. I would dilute my attention, okay? Um, when it comes down to values, our non-negotiables would be, we, we always treat our customers first, right? We're an outsource solution, but we get on their email, we get into their Slack, we really involve ourselves in the business. And I have a team of five accountants that I train this way. Every one of them has to be cultural fit with me and my values, my company's values as well as provide service to my customers, okay? Now my customers, on the other hand, um, we always set expectations, okay? So, but however, there are always like, there's, there's events, for example, someone gets sick or someone gets married, any type of human events can happen. So we have a very like congenial environment where I, and our customers understand this as well. Like we're not very pushy about things. Right, and I guess the non-negotiable here is just to be nice. Um, I know it, it sounds so playground-ish. Like I tell my daughter that she's four, I'm like just be nice. Mm -hmm. But it really means a lot. Um, we have human relationships. Our clients are human. Like we use automation, we use a lot of tools, we use APIs to do our job. But at the end of the day, right, maintain a human relationship, value your clients, and they will value you. And you could always work out any issues. Yeah, it's really refreshing to hear you say that because I think sometimes in, especially in the fast pace of New York City, we tend to get lost in realizing that behind everything, there is usually another human being there. So I think that's a really wonderful non-negotiable value that you have as a part of your company. And you mentioned that you have five accountants who work with you and you have trained. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how you kind of built up your company and I know you talked about your own uh, networking to then get your first client, but in terms of like the internal affairs and the internal 
ways that the company works? How did you build that up? Maybe tell us what a typical day looks like for you. Sure. Um, how I built that up. Okay. So, you know, talking about values, right. Um, and talking about values in conjunction with how I started my company. The idea was more of a finance consultancy. Okay. Um, we do financial modeling for our clients, cash runway projections. We really dive deep into the business, work closely with the CEO on developing their, um, not just the current status quo model, but various scenarios for the next 36 and the next 48 months out. And these models are used in discussions with VCs to raise additional capital, which is critical for the startups, as you know, right? Um, as I'm developing this, what's going on is we're finding out that the accounting isn't that strong. So SPNA accounting, for whatever reason, has some type of disconnect. Where SPNA is developing a model with certain lines. For example, if you're a SaaS company, you have subscription revenue, you have cost of delivery, um, you have some data expense, uh, some marketing expense. Fine. That's how the financial models develop. On the accounting side, it looks like a cookie cutter chart of accounts. So you have like these humans that's moving the data, right, in a very non-sophisticated way, trying to get this chart of accounts to match into a financial statement model. So that's the first thing. When I hired, right, I said, hey, let's put on the finance lens. Always keep who your end users are in mind and what your use cases are. Yes, you're doing bookkeeping. Yes, you know, it is a, a record of actual, okay? but those actuals are the basis for future. So we keep that in mind, right? And I train my staff to think not just like a bookkeeper, not just like an accountant, but really as a comprehensive solution, a comprehensive finance solution for our small businesses. And then we're super decentralized. Um, I, I start work around 9, 9.30 after I drop my kid off at daycare. Uh, I slack check in on the status. We do weekly huddles for half an hour, check in with each other, check in on everyone's mental health and just like, I don't know, kids' birthday parties and stuff like that. Um, and we're a team of professionals. We get to work. We look at our timesheets. We look at the ROI on our clients. We talk about issues, right? I try my best not to be a micromanager. And I also think that that might be like a, a female versus male thing, or maybe an Asian female versus male thing. I don't know. But I feel like that females tend to be called micromanagers more often than males do. Um, anyway, but that's outside of finance, right? Because I, I started my own company with the idea of creating my own, own culture, hiring my own people, uh, mm -hmm. betting them with the way that I think about things. So we're super decentralized and we work very well. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like an amazing work environment. And because you, I know you mentioned, uh, I think Deloitte as one of the companies you had worked at before you kind of took off on your own entrepreneur career. So what are some of the differences between, and I'm sure this can be a very long-winded answer, but what are some of the differences between what you've seen in kind of these either fortune 500 companies or more of the corporate setting uh, compared to when you're either in like your own company or startups that you knew for a fact you didn't want to go that direction and you wanted to create, you know, this own cultural value within your company. And that's why, you know, for example, you're a super decentralized culture and, you know, you're not micromanaging any of your employees per se. I, per se, right? Because that's just my opinion. Yes, I, I would have to ask uh, your five accountants. You <laughs> would have to talk to my people. Oh, okay. the shit with 360 feedback. They, they say that. Uh, that's a corporate term, I feel. Um, yeah, I spent, no, I spent time at Deloitte uh, five and a half years, but I was an auditor. So for those who are auditors, you, you're not really part of the company. Like they try to give you a company culture, mm -hmm. really more of a team culture because you work very long hours with your audit team. And you tend to do that at your client site. So you're like hybrid, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's say you get into a, a, a Goldman Sachs, right? So there you are taking up half a floor of Goldman Sachs, 
all the Goldman Sachs people are coming at you, you know, like whatever, you feel their vibe, right? And then you have your manager, your senior manager, and you have that culture. So during my time um, with large broker dealers, it was definitely more um, just the way people wear and the way they communicate um, and the complexity of the financial instruments. It felt complicated. Um, it felt complicated. And as we know, uh, the financial crisis happened. And in part, the financial crisis happened because things were overly complicated, right? People were specializing and siloed in these different types of specialized structure products, from my point of view, um, that they, they didn't take a step back to look at the bigger picture. Like, what was the collateral? What's happening in the global, you know, in a more macro scale? Okay. And that, that I feel, from my point of view, um, I really enjoy small businesses better because corporates tend to overcomplicate things. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, I also really respect corporations because of the wide impact that they have on our everyday lives. My, uh, my grad school roommate, he's part of the Google Maps team, right? Everyone could pull out their smartphone, mm-hmm. open up Google Maps, and go like a carbon neutral group, right? So he was part of the product team developing carbon neutral. Like there are huge benefits of being part of corporate. Mm-hmm. It depends on what your aspirations are. For me, I love small. I love my small businesses. I love my early stage businesses because we see the impact that we ha- we're having on their, you know, on their business, on the operations, on the processes within three to three to six months of joining their team. Yeah. And I really like how you kind of broke it down into, I guess, just some of the differences that people have preferences for because each has their pros and cons and it really just depends on how you work and what you like better. And so there isn't necessarily one being better than the other, just each has its own role in the way our overall society functions. And kind of following along this, you know, like startup culture and things like that, uh, because you are an entrepreneur and you are also the boss of your company, have you ever found it to be difficult finding a work-life balance as an entrepreneur? Uh, because you're essentially your own boss. And if so, how did you find that balance and what do you do to actively maintain it, especially with such a young daughter? Oh my gosh. Um, that's an excellent question. I mean, I tell myself I started my company so I could have my work life balance. Mm-hmm. And in a way I do. My office, it's you know, it's it's I work remotely, it's at home. So I cut out that travel uh inefficiency. Um I am in command of my hours to a certain extent, right? I have to deliver on my client's projects. Mm-hmm. However, I get to determine if I'm working nine to five or after five or before nine. Right, so there's different forces at play. When you report into somebody, generally, you should be there when they're there, okay? Mm -hmm. But I think substantively, once you're a little more senior, substantively, that should trump the form, right? So the substance should trump the form at a certain point in time. But it's being able, and it doesn't matter if your own boss or not, Mm -hmm. it's being able to have that communication um, with your direct, you know, with your supervisor. Um, if that's if, if that's something of value to you. Yeah, awesome. And it's um it's really great to see how you've been able to succeed in finding that balance, especially since you said that was part of the reason why you decided uh, to open your own company so you could do that. And my next question is just what is your favorite part about being an entrepreneur? Oh my goodness. Um it's so interesting. I'm always interested. Uh, I, I get to take my own projects in a way. Mm-hmm. So since 2019, the business has continued to expand. Um, we are about 60% bookkeeping now and 40% uh, FP&A CFO services. At any point in time, that, you know, on average, maybe 50-50. Right now, I'm looking at 60-40. Every client I talk to, every set of financials, I love looking at financial statements. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
Every client I talk to, I learn something new. Like this new DeFi client, no idea what decentralized finance is, no idea what a DAO is, no idea, just no idea, Crypto. right? Yeah. But what, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. um, so, so it's fun. I learned so much. I had another client that dealt in alternative assets, like Birkenbach. I had no idea how expensive they were. You know, now I do. <laughs> um, I have a, another client that's doing early stage oncology. They have a new way of um, a new therapy or combination of therapies to treat different types of cancer. So we're really given, um, really fortunate, but we're given the keys to understand how the sausage is made, right? At least from a financial uh, point of view, from a transaction point of view. And we're, we're given the opportunity to have dialogue with all these super interesting people that's trying to make the world better or like the, their industry better or their lives better, whatever, right? Every business out there has a, has a reason for being and they serve a need. And it's just so interesting and exciting to work with them. And also, you know, there's going to be projects that we turn down because it doesn't fit our, you know, um, our values, our core, or our set, uh, set of tech staff. And that's okay because I get to make those decisions. Mm-hmm. And I kind of want to ask you a little bit about, so it's definitely very, very interesting about how you actually get to learn a lot about other industries because you come in as this kind of consultant and therefore you get to learn about the different sectors. Uh, But you mentioned how there are also certain projects that you will turn down. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about maybe some examples of projects you've turned down and why, and whether that gets easier or if it's very hard to do that, especially when you're in your earlier stages and you're trying to find more uh, customers and it's something that's not really aligned with what you're going, what your values are. Yeah, there's values and then there's core competency. They've turned down clients because they weren't on QuickBooks Online, right? So that's a core competency question. But uh, not so much value, but then there's also just a, a mismatch of, of, I guess, skill sets. We have a perspective, of on, but we're in a very niche industry, like, um, that could be better served with other consultants. For example, e-commerce. Uh, if you're doing B2C on Amazon or eBay, we don't specialize in that. We, we, don't, we don't have any expertise in that. And I would refer them to other people and other companies. Um, general contracting, depending on the level of P&L detail that they're looking for, it may not, we may not be the right solution. Mm. When it comes down to you know, when it comes down to the values of creation, though, as you're having that conversation with your prospective client, you can get a sense of what their company values are and whether or not there's a fit. Mm-hmm. Okay. You get a feel for, are they militant? Are they authoritative? Do they go through consensus? You know, do they take both? You, you get a get a feel, you know, you feel out. It's like an interview. Everything we do, it's, it's it's a getting to know you dance. Um, and quite early on in the introduction call, you either jive with the CEO or you don't. And that's okay. Right. So I'm, I'm, I've been pretty fortunate. There was one client that we had to say goodbye to, um, unfortunately, because he was too demanding of my staff's time. Okay. So I'm very protective of my team. Right, going back to non-negotiable. We're all human. Let's not be pushy. Let's not be bullies. Let's be nice. Play nice in the playground. Yes. If my team is under stress due to side requests that you're not channeling through me, mm-hmm. okay, so I can't prepare their schedule and I can't prepare their time, and you do this like you're a repeat offender, then I need to protect my staff, and we have to find you yeah it's really wonderful uh I'm sure to have a boss like you where you know the expectations that were set were clear and so if there are individuals that are not playing nice like you said or being mindful that you know everybody has what they have to do and that there's only so much you can ask for um that you're setting those boundaries and 
Uh, moving on, we actually have a question uh, from Brianne. So she says, thanks for being here, Stacey. Um, and she wants to know, uh, what do you see for the future of your company in the next five to 10 years? I said Charmaine would like to answer this question. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. No, I think she's just right. <laughs> no, we all go ahead. Um, tell me because I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. So I went to all this like planning, organizational behavior, goal setting. And don't get me wrong, I really try my hardest to set smart goals, to plan my short term and my long term. But experience shows me that I really just don't know. And one of the things I struggle with, right, mm -hmm. um, is do I want to grow? Because I know I could grow. Mm -hmm. I know I could hire five accountants today and triple my book. But this goes back to 2018. I also really want my work-life balance. I think I'm a little selfish. So I'm not sure, Brianne. I, I, I struggle with this all the time. Like whenever I have a minute to myself, I'm having a cup of coffee, no one's talking to me, and I'm trying to map out the future, and it's always been two paths. I stay with the core team and the target. Uh, I always have targeting, right? Like this is how much I want to make. This is how much I spend, blah, blah, blah. This is how much I save. This is how much I need to return. I think we'd be silly to not do that exercise for ourselves in our financial future. Okay, so I have that. I have a baseline. But I don't know if I want to be a million or five million dollar business. And I'm telling you guys right now, I know I can. I just don't know if that's what I want. So um, I, I really, really hope that you guys ask me this again next year and I have a different answer. Because right now, I, I don't, I'm not really sure. If I find the right partner to grow with me, then they could take over a segment of the business and we could like win more business together. It's also tough because Stacey Chen is the next consulting today. I have staff, I have senior accountants, I have a principal, but it's, it's me and my clients, you know? So I, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think that's, a very genuine answer that maybe makes a lot of us feel better too um because i think sometimes people think that like you must have a direction that you know you're going into or going towards and it's okay to not really have one sometimes because you're just trying to kind of figure things out and um i'll kind of build off of brianne's question a little bit because given the current state of the economy i'm sure Finance is a big, big question and a big concern with all kinds of companies, whether it's Fortune 500s or your startups. And so I'm curious if this has kind of affected uh, your business or even as you started in 2019, and I'm assuming that was kind of right before COVID kind of hit. So how did you navigate, you know, these two big financial situations that have impacted our economy? Yeah. Uh 2019, I was lucky to start my business February 2019. Okay. I had an anchor client by August, mm -hmm. September of 2019. Um, and then I got a couple of other clients in that year before COVID hit. And then COVID hit and everyone's on this like technological uh, incline, right? Now everyone's scrambling to decentralize, to be on, uh, sorry, to be on the web, right? To be remote. Um, and that was good for my business because we offer a fully remote solution to our clients. I can mm -hmm. create faith uh, in person, but it's mostly remote. Um, what's happening right now is having a larger impact on my clients. So I serve the startup, the small VC backed startup space, um, in the small businesses space. So distribution of revenue used to be 50 50, it's now 60 40. Because startups are not fundraising as much. Right. So that's one impact. But I picked that up on my bookkeeping side. The small businesses that I work for are, are doing still fairly well. Okay. It's those small businesses, however, whose contracts are mostly large corporates, that's getting attention. Right. Because if Amazon lays off, I don't know, 
100,000 workers, right? How, how can they continue doing a new product dev? Uh, it's anyway, so they're in with their corporate budget. So I'm, I'm seeing some pressure on my the time being. Um, my, my business is still doing well. We signed on new one new project this week, one new bookkeeping this week. Sorry, two new projects this week, one new bookkeeping this week, one new bookkeeping two weeks ago, and a couple of D devs. And I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. I don't even know if I have enough people for today. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, yeah, well, uh, congrats on signing on so many um, new projects this week. Um, although I'm sure it's probably super busy, but uh, it kind of leads a little bit to our next question, which is from Stephanie. And Stephanie is asking, uh, when you think about your company's current operations or what they might look like in the future, do you rely more on your experience and gut instincts or on the advice that's given to you from your professional business groups? I listen to what's out there and with my own needs. Like going back to, I mean, I don't mean, I, I don't mean to use the word selfish in a negative way. Mm -hmm. But I do think I'm a selfish individual with respect to work-life balance. So I had a call with a, um, I guess a peer, uh, except he specializes in e-commerce. Midwest, okay? And he started his company around the same time I did, maybe a year after. He's like, I'm gonna make a million this year. This is, these are the only clients I want. I'm like, oh wow, you're so focused. Yeah. So maybe that's why I'm, you know, we're, we're also a little different, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a certain level. And he's like, you should do this. You know, you, you should focus on X, Y, Z area. And I'm like, maybe. Like, thank you for your opinion. I'm going to put it in this big box of opinions that I have, mm -hmm. and the life that I have. See what the averages are, <laughs> right? So you see, yeah. see what I leave. Um, and my husband's a, you know, he, he has a pretty big boy. And I, uh, with my husband and my daughter, and our family decisions, and I think our work is really part of family as well, like total well being. So then we also talk about what are the different avenues that I could take Synax Consulting down, and I get his advice too. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not just me, right? It's, it's me and my selfish one, and against that is all of this stuff, right? One is you could expand your business, you could hire more people, you know, you could you could do so much more. And other ones like, but I already can't sleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I just, I'm just not sure. So mm -hmm. I think I'm at a crossroads this year. I think it's going to be a great year. But I'm not sure. There's a lot I need to discover for myself just because I'm an entrepreneur, or maybe it's because I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have a lot of support. You know, since the kind, I'm kind of at the top, right? So my decisions are based on my experiences, um, and I'm thankful to have all the experiences that I do have. So far, I've not had one client turnover. So far, I've had no staff leave me, okay? Um, and I'm really proud of those facts. So do I want to grow super fast like a startup? Keeping in mind, I advise startups. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It looks really painful. I don't know. I yeah. Don't know. Well, That'd be another question that I don't have an answer to. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I will say that I really admire how in the midst of, I think sometimes, especially being in New York City, there is this unspoken pressure of if you succeed, you have to keep going because there's always more. And that's, I mean, that's capitalism. It's you'll never reach the top because you can just always keep on growing bigger. Even Amazon can grow bigger. And you being able to understand that there are certain things you want, like a work-life balance. So until you find the right partner for growing your business, that you're not going to push yourself over the edge where, you know, you might be making $5 million, <clears throat> but at what cost of your personal life. Um, that is something I find really admirable. So we are at 650 uh, right now. So I wanna just remind everybody, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box. But in the meantime, I will keep our discussion going because I also do have 
Um, a few more questions uh, for Stacy. So, and, and am I coming across as like a really lazy person? No, no, I don't think so at all. And I like your explanation about how um, it's. You know, I feel like there's got to be a better word that I also can't think of right now too. But it's not selfish. Um, it's you just really knowing what you want, and I think that's so awesome because it also demonstrates the growth of confidence and i think also as an as an east asian female that's something that we struggle with culturally a lot is well we just want to do really well but it's like am i doing it right am i doing enough am i sacrificing enough if i'm comfortable maybe i'm not doing enough um so i think it's really awesome how you're touching on that and we actually do have a question another question here so it says um is there one advice you would give to all your clients or any advice you would give to all your clients? Um, always collect your cash. I mean, <laughs> uh, cash is king. We, we keep a very serious eye on all of our clients' cash. It's, um, you know, the, the quick way to assess your own way is take a look at your, depending on the, the cycle, and the speed that your company's in, maybe three month average or six month average, look at how much money you have in the bank and start thinking about financing options. Okay. If you are a VC company, you just raised a really big round, all right, and you're burning fast, when you have that cash in through the door, it might be the best time for you to take out a line of credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, like things like that. It's always cash based. Like we, we do the whole relationship thing, but you know, always keep in mind that. I always keep in mind that my company provides a financial and accounting solution to our client. Why? Because they want to know their P&L. Why? Because they want to know if they're making money, when they're making money, and when they're going to run out of money. And we should know that for ourselves, too, right, from a personal finance uh, standpoint. So, so that's why I tell them. And be nice. Yes. But they're already nice. I love, yeah, I, I love all my clients. You know, you actually remind me of one thing, and that I'm, that I'm a little worried about, mm -hmm. which is I am nice. So when I, uh, I've spent no money on marketing. All of my businesses are referrals. And I can't seem to say no. Okay. Right. If it fits like, oh, you know, down QBO and you know, a friend of a friend, <laughs> or if they're VC and they come from this VC backed company. Mm -hmm. who, partner I'm close with, I just take the business on, okay? So I think in a way that organically in itself will end up stretching the next out. Mm -hmm. So being more thoughtful about Brian's question is if I can't say no, which is not a bad thing, these are really great leads, really great people in company, then I need to plan forward. What I did in 2023, January 2023, is I set some VHAGs for my team, four of them. And if we reach them, we're going on a company retreat, right? So everyone has buy-in. So I think in, in that sense, I do expect FNAC to grow. I just need it to grow at a modest pace until I find a partner to, you know, take it to the next level with or something like that. Yeah. And... I mean, we can't wait to see when you do find that partner and take it to the next level. And maybe this time next year, you will have, you know, you'll be at a complete new level, um, which is so amazing to think about. So, you know, we're looking forward to that. Um, but uh, let's see, there are no new questions right now, but I have a few more that um, I can, you know, keep us going with. So um, I wanted to ask you about kind of following the question about advice. Um, you know, you gave advice that you would give your clients. What are some advice you would give to anybody looking to kind of go into um, finance or just like entrepreneurial careers within finance or any resources that you found to be very helpful? I know you mentioned LinkedIn briefly. Um, any other resources that you think could be really helpful for students or just individuals looking to learn more? Um. So that, that, that's a, okay. So there's a couple questions there. Yeah. Um, for people who are aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, know what product and or service you're selling, why you're selling it, who your intended market is. You know, talk to your friends, your family, pitch them, see if that resonates. If it doesn't, 
find a different audience. You might, you might be talking to the wrong person. I talked mm-hmm. to my mom. She's like, don't do it, you know? Yeah. So talk to someone else. Um, anyway, so just gather feedback from a variety of individuals, particularly those within your audience group. Um, that'll give you some, some good insight. Uh, for those pursuing finance, Finance and accounting are intricately related. So for those investment bankers who uh, who are really good at their jobs, they know to dig into the accounts, right? They know to um, really understand what makes the company shine so they could present it in the best light. Um, also, they definitely have to do their due diligence. Um, what else did you ask? Resources. Your, your network's really the best one. It really is. Like you could read a lot of books and I think books are great. Uh, I don't remember one off the top of my head. I but I still do think books are great. <laughs> I do think books are great. Um, there's tons of podcasts out there for those who's trying to create their own Shopify channel. Like there's a Shopify podcast. For those who's trying to create their own consultancy, there's a two box podcast. Right? When you're on your commute, just pop it in your ear. See if something sounds interesting to you. Mm, there's no lack of noise and advice and opinion out there. So you just got to uh, maybe write down what it is you want to do, you know, your guiding light, and then let the, the rest of it influence and color that in, right? That's because you're not an island. Um, yeah, but really be, be confident. And confidence isn't confidence. Confidence should be based on facts and skills. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not because you think you're the best thing out there. Right. You might be, but support it with your facts and your skills and your background and your case studies and things like that. I love it. Um, so yes, it's. I think that's good advice for myself along with everybody else uh, about confidence and how to navigate that. And uh, one last question question uh, from Stephanie, which I think will also be our last one before we end our event for tonight, which is, if you had to pick just one thing, what motivates you to do what you do professionally? You know, I money is not a motivating factor. So there you go. <laughs> we get paid. Yes. Right. But, 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 um, I don't mean to be cheeky about that. I just think that we, we need to make money as humans in society, right? But uh, in, in addition to that, what really motivates me and what keeps me up at night at the same time are my clients' businesses. So Finac takes this really in-house approach where we get to know their product and what they're thinking and like help them come up with strategies. I talk to the CEOs once a month, half an hour call. Um, and I decompress that night and I'm thinking about, oh my goodness, you know, why is this, uh, why is this happening for client A? What's going on with client B? You know, oh my, you know, they need a controller client C. Who, who can we have to fill in that role for them? Who's qualified? Um, and that keeps me going because there's so many mysteries. I loved working at startup. I was employee, one of the first 25 employees at Better Mortgage. I was, uh, and I developed their accounting and finance team. I was the first senior finance hire at Transfix, another tech startup in New York City. Um, I developed their KPIs and their DSO, uh, and did some other stuff there. But um, the reason why I started Finax also is because I was challenged by these issues, right? Like all startups have a reason for being. There's a reason why VCs throw so much money at an early stage company because they have potential to solve real world problems. Mm -hmm. And for me to even be a fractional part of that and solve those problems alongside, even for a little while until they get their bearing, the product market fit, and then they like develop their own team and go kick ass, that's great. But even for that little bit, that keeps me interested and motivated. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And you're right that, you know, startups all have their purpose and they're all trying to solve very real problems that a lot of the times are maybe, you know, solutions are outdated and they've been, there's been a very dire need for solutions that just haven't been put out there yet. Um, So that's, that's really wonderful to hear that that is what kind of keeps you going in addition to just having to pay your bills. Um, And so with that, um, it takes us right to 7 p.m. So thank you so much for joining us, Stacey, and I'll hand the mic back over to Charmaine.
Yeah, so I would love to say thank you so much, Stacey. And Anne, you did a wonderful job. I I think all the gems that you shared with us, Stacey, um, you know, sharing all of your advice and just taking lessons from your journey helps someone else who's looking to actually go on their own entrepreneurial journey. So, and I think that networking point that you made, it's, we have to say, Macaulay has over 6,000 alumni now in the network. Please re reach out to one another. You're such a great and talented group of people and you should know one another. So that will be my one advice for tonight for all that's listening and if you're alumni, but on behalf of Macaulay community and everyone, the Dean, Dean Byrne, thank you so much, Stacey, for sharing your journey with us. And thank you, Anne. Have a great night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night.